Thanks for watching this special program, the second installment of RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation, presented by UiPath. It was recorded live at the Marriott Marquis in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Francis Rose, with the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Earlier this year, the American Artificial Intelligence Initiative sent a clear message to federal agencies. It's time to spur the development and regulation of AI by encouraging emerging technology like robotic process automation. Dozens of federal agencies and their private sector partners are already putting RPA to use by automating routine tasks in human capital management, customer experience, and more. With that in mind, we have a lot of ground to cover in the next 30 minutes, so let's get started. Veronica Villalobos is Principal Deputy Associate Director for Employee Services at the Office of Personnel Management. Conrad Vanderpool is Head of the Americas for UiPath. Folks, thanks very much for joining me. Veronica, I want to start with you. What are you doing at OPM with RPA? Where are you in the process and how are you looking at RPA strategically? Right, well, as part of the President's management agenda, we're very much focusing on how we create that workforce for the 21st century mm -hmm. and util utilizing modern IT. So we're bringing those two, we're marrying them, and we're thinking about the strategy. Mm -hmm. How do we give the agencies the tools and the data they need first? Secondly, how do we do some incubator work? How can the agency pilots help us figure out how to do this in a larger scope, mm -hmm. right? And then thirdly, how do we create a growth mindset for employees? For so long, we would get our degrees, we'd come into the workforce, and we think that's what we're going to do for the rest of our lives. So we're trying to get people to think a little differently and to acclimate into this kind of RPA environment and eventually artificial intelligence. Um, we're really excited about what's happening in some of the agencies. We're seeing some of them where they're already using the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. They're providing better customer service. Um, and they're finding that the employees love it. The employees are the ones developing the use cases. The employees are the ones who are helping the technology evolve to what they need it to be. So we're seeing some exciting things. Conrad, the major driver in RPA, it strikes me, within the last six months or so, has been this intersection of artificial intelligence and RPA. What's behind that? What does that intersection look like? And how? what's the potential, you think, to either maximize the potential of RPA or maybe even to revolutionize the way that organizations are using it? Yeah, so the, uh, the potential for artificial intelligence um, decision making really um, has been one of, the, one of the reasons for the fast deploy um, and growth of the RPA market, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the reason, the way we see that is, uh, you know, AI is essentially a set of data, right? Uh, with smarts in it uh, that's looking for a place to be called out. Um, RPA tends to digitize lots of processes and it creates lots of call-out points for, um, towards an AI data set, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that's, that's why it's a, a great enabler um, of, uh, of AI technology. Uh, it's also the reason why, um, why Google's venture arm, uh, CAPG, is a, is a major investor in us. Um, they, they see a big future for their AI business um, and they believe that RPA and being involved closely with uh, a leading RPA company um, can help them uh, figure out how to, uh, how to maximize that potential. Veronica, what's your sense of what agencies are finding out about something you mentioned a moment ago, which is how is this changing the employee experience? How is it making it either more challenging for agencies to explain this to their people, or how is it making it making the employee life better so that that person says, yeah, I like the way that my job is evolving and I want to keep doing it? Right. So I love this saying uh, that the NSF CIO uses. She says she likes to take work that people loathe mm -hmm. and transform it to work that they love doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's high, low value to high value. Yep. And that sounds a little scary to people at first because I think when you say reskill, are you saying I have the wrong skills? Mm -hmm. And what we've been doing is working with folks to say, no, what you have is opportunity, opportunity to grow in different directions. So we're looking at where we might have some skills gap, uh, where there might be areas for potential growth overall to achieving mission and trying to align people's skills with those new opportunities. Great example is the Cybersecurity uh, Skills Academy, where we're going to be training folks so that they can start doing cybersecurity. And those are federal employees who had high aptitude in that area but had never done anything in IT. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing some really good results. So that's the idea. We're going to work with employees, make sure they're part of the process, make sure we have good change management efforts across the board, um, and make the employee the center point 
point uh, for how we're going to get this done. Mm -hmm. In that change management equation, what's the responsibility of the agency for explaining to the employee this is what's going to happen and this is what you can expect? And what's the responsibility of the employee to say, this is a new part of my job and it's another duty as assigned, as the, is the term that I think uh, HR professionals use. And so I kind of need to get on the train here and, and learn these new skills and be a part of what's happening moving forward. Yeah, we see it as a partnership, uh -huh. right? So, so much in our lives right now is based around how we do it for the individual. You set up your iPhone the way you want it, you set up your computers the way you want them. So part of it is making sure that we're setting up information and learning opportunities the way that's gonna work best for the individual employee. So that's how far the agency needs to go. On the other side of it is the employee saying, here's what the vision is for my Myself, and I'm going to take control of my career moving forward and move in that direction. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a real partnership there. Um, but for all involved, it has to be treated like a partnership and a coaching opportunity. Mm -hmm. Conrad? Yeah, so just to build on that, right? So, uh, so employee satisfaction is a, is a major sort of value driver for us, right? Um, it isn't just about efficiency gains. Uh, it isn't just about you know, more compliance and reduced error rates. Um, employee satisfaction is a, is a, is a, is a clear and distinct uh, value that our customers get out of the technology for all the reasons that you're, that you're describing. Um, what we're finding is that um, our mission uh, and, and, and vision really of uh, a robot for every worker um, is, is simply attainable now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with our um, attended robot technology. Uh, every person can have a robot and uh, uh, does the mundane work. Um, and uh, we call that also getting, taking the robot out of the worker. Um, it really then leaves the fun work, the customer facing work, the more challenging work, uh, the more complicated work uh, for, the, uh, for the workers. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's a major drive for the industry. Should agencies or, or other organizations use employee satisfaction and maybe some of the statistics that OPM develops in that way as part of measuring the return on investment? Is there a way to kind of quantify that or tie a dollar value to that to, to determine we spent this much on RPA and this is the result that we got? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so one of our largest customers, um, I can't mention their name, but they're, uh, they're a major knowledge worker company globally, you mm -hmm. know, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, they, they are following that strategy and uh, their expectation is that uh, by, by increased um, employee satisfaction, they're going to be a cooler company. They're going to be more attractive as an employer, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, that translates into all kinds of metrics. But uh, yeah, absolutely, it's measurable. And that's certainly a goal that the government has had for a long time. Different administrations have said it in different ways, but for as long as I've been in this space, making it cool to work for the government again yeah. has been a, a goal that people have been going after, right? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we did is we developed an executive toolkit mm -hmm. that will help them figure out what is the data telling us about how we could restructure, reshape, reskill our workforce and really drive that mm -hmm. satisfaction um, and make sure that we're retaining the right employees and helping those who maybe aren't a good fit figure out what's going to be best for them mm -hmm. in some other environment. That's where I wanted to go as we start to wrap up for Veronica, this is not going to be a fit for everybody, and I, I wonder what the responsibility is of the agency and the employee when somebody says, I'm not sure this is the best fit for my career, to help that person find a, a good fit for, some, for them somewhere down the road. Yeah, so there's various approaches, right? Uh, we have one agency we're working with right now. What we've been doing is analyzing the data, and for those who want to go into a different work stream, learn new skills, we're able to work with the agency to accomplish that work. Mm -hmm. There are a few, though, who say, I'm good at what I do, and I don't mm -hmm. necessarily want to do something different. So we're looking at other agencies to figure out where might they fit in in their same local area mm -hmm. so that they can uh, continue to be happy happy, productive federal employees. We have about 30 seconds left, Conrad. Give me kind of a thumbnail of what the state of the art is today for RPA in the commercial sector that maybe government agencies can aspire to. State of the art is a, uh, is a well-functioning center of excellence, um, also named a robotics operations center, um, that takes in uh, large numbers of, of use cases, as they're called, and turns them around into automated processes for the enterprise on a global basis. Um, typically, you know, counting into thousands of robots. Conrad, Veronica, thanks both very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Awesome. Pleasure. Up next, we'll shift our focus from how public and private sector organizations are executing RPA-driven strategies 
to the larger need for high-tech skills in the workforce and in the economy. You're watching RPA, powering the government's digital transformation on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Do you know why robots are here? So we are free to do the things we love. So we don't spend hours and days and weeks doing one tedious thing after another. The truth is, this is the ultimate collaboration. Robots do all the boring backroom stuff, so we don't have to. We can dream big and push ourselves to be our best versions. So that everyone progresses, everyone wins. Welcome back to this special program, the second installment of RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation, presented by UiPath. It was recorded live at the Marriott Marquis in Washington, D.C. The private sector's learned lessons around scaling and sustaining its tech workforce. Those lessons can be put to use as government advances robotic process automation. Elizabeth Lindsay is Executive Director at Bite Back, and Mark Mancher is Global Public Services Lead for Robotics and Cognitive at Deloitte. Folks, thanks very much for joining me. Mark, I want to start with you. What are people learning in the private sector about maturation and scaling of robotics process automation? Sure. So robotics is about 10 years old now in the private sector. Really got going about five years ago. So we're now seeing some uh, places at scale. And what they're learning as they get to scale is that it's more than just building bots. You have to have an infrastructure in place, almost like Maslow's hierarchy. You have to have a pyramid. You have to have an infrastructure in place. You have to have people that are going to receive it, then you have to have people that build it, and then you have to maintain it. Because bots, just like people, the digital labor in the workforce today, they have changes that need to be made in the environment, and so these need to be cared and feeded for, just like uh, a person who's doing the work in the environment. Elizabeth, what do we learn, what have we learned over that 10-year process about the workforce, the kind of skills that an organization needs to have, and what how to develop that over time as the model matures within an organization. Absolutely. The workforce has changed so drastically over the past 10 to 20 years. Automation has created such incredible ways of us being more efficient and doing our work better. At the same time, our training of individuals, especially people without college degrees, has, has not caught up mm -hmm. with the workforce. And so that's really what uh, my organization, Bite Back, what we're really thinking about. How can we train the next generation of workers to work on bots, to work on robotic process automation so that they're not left behind because of these changes. What makes a good bot person? You know what? I, it's a great question. What, what would you say? What makes a great bot person? Well, you need to think logically. Uh, initially, with some simple bots, you could just have someone who's been through training. But in a mature organization, someone who understands software development is important because these are living, breathing software development products. Mm -hmm. So someone who understands how the SDLC works and then can come back and fix things as they need to be fixed in the environment. So again, initially, we can have uh, people learn to do simple bots, but as they get more complex, I think you need to have someone who actually understands uh, IT or software development in the long run. Elizabeth, one of the things that we've talked about in all of these conversations, in all the conversations I've had about RPA, is the potential impact on a workforce that's not sure that they're necessarily moving from low value to high value work. They're worried that they're moving from low value work to no value work. How are you seeing that play out in the private sector? And what have you seen successful organizations do to help their employees understand there's plenty more work to do, we're just gonna have you do more valuable things. Absolutely, so we really see that um, there are individuals who I've met and who I know who have lost jobs. They were doing kind of what we call lower value work mm -hmm. and then the jobs disappeared. One of our bite back staff actually worked at a fast food restaurant and a lot of the workers were replaced with kiosks, for mm -hmm. example. And I think the organizations that are successful are really investing in training people so that they get those higher level skills so that they have a job and that they have a job that's meaningful mm -hmm. um, and so we can let the bots do the work that that maybe isn't as exciting or necessary for mm -hmm. people to do. I also think it's so exciting if I might that um, no one goes home and says I did a thousand emails yeah. do they people say I solved this problem and if you're in the, the service of citizens and you can solve something it's a lot more satisfying mm -hmm. and so most people have the basic skills they need to do the next job 
but because there's not enough money or funding, we have people doing work which is not necessarily as most satisfying. And so the retraining, I don't think you need as much because mm -hmm. people actually already know the environment. They can now deliver better service to citizens. So I, I think it's, it's where we're heading. I want to go back to something that you said at the beginning of the conversation, Mark, and you said that this has been common in the private sector for about 10 years. It's really ramped up within the last five. Is there something we can learn from that first five years that as all of this technology and the knowledge of it matures, that, that a kind of a, a lesson to apply to help scale and accelerate? So yes and no. I think that we can take the lessons learned of what is needed to scale, but the federal government is a different beast, as we all know, to scale. This year in the federal marketplace, I thought we'd see a lot of vertical scaling where I had three bots, I had 20 bots, I had 100 bots. I didn't see it this year. What I saw was more agencies building that never did before. So while well, before we had um, small, that small's maybe gone to a dozen or two. Now what I'm seeing though is more places doing their first iterations of bots, so we're laying the foundation. So we can take the first five years that came out of the private sector, we understand how to build COEs now, the, the technical skills, the financial skills, the business skills, the governance that's associated with it, and we can now bring it into government, and I think this next year we're gonna see the vertical scaling out of all these agencies that have now tested, tried, and proven that this works. So Elizabeth, as Mark is describing all of these things, I'm imagining somebody, maybe not even in a technology shop, but in a human resources shop, mm -hmm inside an agency who's thinking, I gotta go out and find people at some point, because we don't have enough people internally who can do all of those things. Is there some process, some certification that exists, or maybe that should exist, so that those people can say, I know for sure that when I look at Elizabeth, I can see she has this credential or this achievement that she's gonna be a great fit on my team to, to be able to do bots. Absolutely. So uh, Biteback is partnering with UiPath right now to train a group of individuals, people who didn't go to college, people who are new to the tech sector, to get a certification in robotic process automation. And it's really, really exciting. These are folks who do want that higher value work to be able to do problem solving, to be able to really enter into the space to make a living wage. And I think it's really uh, the wave of the future, having individuals get this type of training and certification. What does that process look like for somebody who maybe is early career, mid-career, but they're already in the workforce and they're thinking, I don't want to do a lower level job my whole life, yeah. I, but I can't afford to go back to college and take on the debt or all of that. What is Absolutely. that? What is that? kind of stair step look like. Yeah. Like so luckily there are wonderful organizations and nonprofits, government programs that do provide training for free or for low cost. So here in Washington DC, individuals who are interested in this type of career can come to an organization like Bite Back, get assessed, and we help them um, no matter what level of tech training they have, we help them start there and then move up into this more complex training. There are opportunities out there. Um, I think it just requires people to do a little searching and find something that is a good fit for them. Mark, we have less than a minute left, but this sounds like another great opportunity along with the Cyber Reskilling Academy that OMB is running to do something like this on a government-wide, enterprise-wide basis to help develop this talent. I would agree, and we're starting to see some of uh, the initial pieces of this. We're starting to see the COP that was just announced out of GSA, where we're going to have a community of practice now across government that can tackle these kind of issues. So I applaud those that are looking at this at an enterprise level so we can get the right training in place, so that way as the wave of vertical scaling comes, we have the right skills in the federal government, both in the contracting force and in the uh, civil service force to address this. One more thought, what does the right training, using that phrase that you just used, what does that look like to you? It depends upon where you are in, the, um, in your maturity. Using organizations like this that can give people the initial UiPath training at the more basic level is critical. And then after you start to build, understanding the more complex things you know, needs to be done also. Mark, Elizabeth, thanks both very Thank much. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. Thanks a lot. The end goals for robotic process automation line up pretty well with the president's management agenda. Up next, we'll drill down on one of them. You'll learn how to leverage RPA for better customer experience right after this. Do you know why robots are here? So we are free to do the things we love. So we don't spend hours and days and weeks doing one tedious thing after another. 
The truth is, this is the ultimate collaboration. Robots do all the boring backroom stuff, so we don't have to. We can dream big and push ourselves to be our best versions so that everyone progresses, everyone wins. So far, we've covered how robotic process automation is being put to use at the Office of Personnel Management in the private sector and at nonprofit organizations designed to bridge the high tech skills gap. Now, let's take a look at some of the larger goals for RPA and government with a pair of private sector pros. John Cho is the Chief Technologist for Civilian State and Local Group at Perspecta, and Jonathan Paget is Vice President for U.S. Federal at UiPath. Gentlemen, thanks both very much for joining me. John, I'll start with you. One area that we haven't heard a lot about for RPA yet is in customer experience. Tell me how that's working for some of the organizations that you're working with. Well, what we're finding a lot in the government space is that people are translating what they're experiencing personally through maybe services they're dealing with, let's just say Amazon or Netflix, and mm -hmm. they're saying, you know, why can't I have that in the government? And so that's really drawn up this pent-up demand for easy access, for automation, for precision. And really the, the problem here for the government is that from a budget standpoint, they just can't afford to just integrate all this together. Mm -hmm. RPA provides a much better way in terms of ROI to really bring those capabilities together and give them that experience without having to mess with the application. In some cases, the application is so legacy, they don't, no one even wants to touch it. Right. So, Jonathan, one of the things that John's getting at has been something that the government has found itself in for as long as I've been in the government space, 10, 15 years, which is citizens expect the same kinds of services from their government that they get from private sector companies. Government has a hard time keeping up with the curve. What's the opportunity that you see for using RPA to at least narrow that gap, if not close it all together? I think a, a couple of things. One is RPA gives uh, agencies a, to, the ability to deliver uh, better government and create happier employees, right? By taking those arduous mundane tasks off their desk and allowing them, freeing them up for higher value work that we keep hearing about. I'll even add on to this, yeah. on top of that, just um, agencies have a hard time just talking to agencies. Yeah. And uh, so not, not just talking to the citizenship, but they're actually talking to each other better through RPA because there's inter-agency inter, uh, processing that occurs all the time mm -hmm. uh, that RPA would definitely uh, be a slam dunk use case for. So there's a phrase that I think is interesting. It's a people-centric strategy. It seems kind of counterintuitive when you think about using uh, a bot to create a people-centric strategy. How does that work? Either one of you can take that one. Well, I think, I think for us, um, what we're seeing more and more with our customers is that they want to have an experience that is in line with the response that they expect. And it isn't driven by a preference as much as it's driven by requirements. So the requirements are becoming much more aggressive. And so when we have this whole idea of, of empathizing with the stakeholder or stakeholders on what the expectation is, to be brutally honest, automation has to be in play. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't sit there and say, I'm going to bring in a team of 10 people who are just going to you know, push this process through manually. It's just not acceptable at that point because they're not just reporting to their own stakeholders, but they're having to report that you know, even more in the open with this more open government, open digital, uh, I would say open insights mm -hmm. that, that the public can actually see them do. Yeah, Jonathan, what do you think is the biggest hurdle to getting to what John is talking about? I think there's still an awareness. I think there's some trepidation mm -hmm. on what bots can do and what they can't do. Uh, but I think that gap is closing quickly with uh, a lot of the uh, memos that are coming out of the White House, uh, encouraging agencies to look at RPA as a way to you know, move people into higher value work mm -hmm. and free up some of those mundane tasks. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, some people in government are talking about is where bots, somebody's working with some kind of bot on just about every mm -hmm. occasion. Is that, is that soon? Or is that far away? Is that even a realistic possibility? I mean, I, I, I know as practitioners here, you probably don't want to get into the silver bullet syndrome where I've got the tool that's going to solve every issue, but I wonder what you think the landscape looks like. John, you go first. Well, so 
I think that we're fast approaching that place. And, and just to give you kind of a little bit of a, an understanding, um, we're seeing multiple agencies almost, it's almost like they all talk to each other. When mm -hmm. I, it's not really, it's interesting. So they're, all, they're almost, almost simultaneously in the same time period approaching, and not just us, booths are approaching other competitors out there who service the government and saying, hey, what do you have on RPA? And so I really do feel like there's just this pent up demand that says, I have been spending all of this money for these four or five teams of people. And quite honestly, I need them to be doing some other things because the expectations and the goals that have been set forth are much higher and we can't get to them. Mm -hmm. It sounds like what John's talking about, Jonathan, is GSA is starting a community of practice focused around RPA. It's already launched and people are starting to come on board. Does that make sense in your view as a way for a lot of people across government to learn without having to reinvent the wheel every yeah. time as John's alluding to? Absolutely. I think agencies are always looking for a first, mm -hmm. someone to lead the way, right? And I think GSA is doing a tremendous job at not only leading the way but creating awareness mm -hmm. for the capability of, of RPA. What do you, what What's the vision that somebody should go into this process with, though, Jonathan? What should, what, how do you want people to think about the expectations that they should have? Separate it out from the bots piece. What are the results that they should think are reasonable to obtain early on? One of the things that I've seen over the years is a new technology comes along. People think, oh, this is going to be, as I said, silver bullet syndrome. And they lose interest when their expectations, original expectations are not met. Wondering what you think that looks like now to avoid that when it comes to RPA. Yeah, I think one of the most exciting aspects of RPA is 100% is uh, error reduction in, in mundane tasks, you know, error prone uh, processes out there that are, you know, very, very repetitive and difficult to perform day in, day out. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the most exciting aspects and, and decreasing data lag, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if then maybe the big challenge in the not too distant future, John, is going to be agencies understanding that RPA is a good fit for fill in the blank, whatever thing that they just haven't thought of yet. I mean, that, that, that strikes me as, as maybe the biggest roadblock at some point. So mm -hmm. I, I've told Jonathan this, and I mean, he's, he's already heard my view on this. I mean, we actually have an opportunity to rethink how work gets done. So right now, a lot of folks are in their adoption phase. They're looking at, OK, how can RPA make my work faster, more efficient, but like your point here, going forward, how can work actually get done mm -hmm. now, now that we have this? And so it's, it's a paradigm shift that people are, are not going to be jumping on the boat right away to do, but once they start understanding the technology, they're going to say, you know what, I can actually start asking the question, what does great look like? Mm -hmm. What does great look like? And how do I walk that backwards to what I have today? Well, RPA is going to be a part of that. And we have about a minute left, but it's then at some point we'll get to where we're thinking, what can we do that we've never done before, rather than just how can we do better the things that we're already absolutely. doing? Is that a fair read, John? Yeah, that's absolutely the case, yeah. yes. And, and just to add to what John's saying, I think the exciting thing for RPA is it's here today. The ROI is out there. There's a lot of talk amongst agencies and, and into the press about the benefits, the early ROIs that they're seeing. And it, it, you know, it accelerates AI, mm -hmm. right? So what is this AI thing? RPA is an on-ramp mm -hmm. in many ways to right. AI and accelerates it. Excellent. Jonathan and John, thanks both very much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching this special program, the second installment of RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation, presented by UiPath. For more information on the subject matter we discussed today, go to govmatters.tv slash UiPath. For the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network, I'm Francis Rose.